You're listening to a message presented at Newmarket Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in Newmarket, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at Newmarket Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. I enjoy getting to share the gospel with you. We've been going on a journey now, a good long time. Most of this year, we've been going through a book called The Story. It summarizes scripture so that we can get an overview of what the Bible has to say to us. If you're reading along in that book called The Story, uh, we're on chapter 28, and there's only 31 chapters. You know what that means? We're almost done with the story. That means we started in Genesis, and we have worked our way through, and we are coming to the end of the story, which is going to be in the book of Revelation. You've got it right. This week we're in the story, chapter 28. If you're reading along in Scripture, we're in Acts chapters 1 through 10 and chapter 12, so that you can kind of see that uh, the story does come right out of Scripture itself. The title for this morning's message, I titled it simply, No Other Name. If you haven't figured it out yet, we live in a world that really is filled with folks who believe it doesn't matter what you believe. We live in a world that's filled with people who believe it doesn't matter what you believe. To these folks, there's one big word that jumps out. Over and over again you hear it. We want unity. We want everybody singing kumbaya and holding hands. We want unity. That's, that's all they focus on. They want unity. And I tell you what, in order to get that unity that they seek, that kumbaya unity, they're willing to sell out their morals. They're willing to sell out their principles in order that they can go with the societal norms. I ain't got news for you. Society can get real messed up real quick. Many are more concerned about what is politically correct what is societally correct than with what is biblically correct. A lot of folks think if the courts okay it, it automatically makes it something that you and I need to rubber stamp. Man, we need to quit thinking that way. We need to understand that the morality of believers is defined by something much higher. If God has declared that it's sinful and inappropriate, it is sinful and inappropriate. It doesn't matter if the whole world goes another direction. Because God knows what is morally okay and what is not. And he shared that with us inside of his word. And I think that part of the problem is we have thrown the Bible away in many instances today. It's become newspaper theology. What's going on here? What's going on there? What's going on? How can I make you feel better? I want to tell you a story. I want to entertain you. That's what many churches have come down to today. But I've got news for you. God laid out the moral high ground many, many, many years ago. Far too many believe that democratic rule trumps God's rule, and that's just not the way it is. In America, we're constantly bombarded with the idea that all gods are equal. Doesn't matter who you believe in. Doesn't matter what God you serve. They're all the same. And that's what people are trying to teach us. Now, I do admit, in America, we have a great, a great amount of freedom. And I think that that freedom is good within reason. I do think it's good for someone to believe over here one way and someone to believe differently over here, and each one of them to be allowed to have their own beliefs. This one shouldn't be able to force this one to accept what they believe, 
and this one shouldn't be a force, able to force this one to accept what they believe. Each person's got to decide for themselves. I understand that. I get that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with there being some differences allowed out there. But the bottom line is, just because you choose to do something, because you have the freedom to choose to do something, doesn't make that something right. We can't all be right, right? Look at them out there. Well, I don't know. You tell us. Can we be? Can we all be right? We live in a world where there's just way too much wrong for everybody to be right. We can choose to worship a rock. We can choose to worship a rock, but that doesn't mean that rock is truly God. All it means is that we've decided to worship a rock. That's what it means. We've decided to worship a rock. I've heard again and again over the years, all religious roads lead to heaven. Have you heard that before? I mean, people are getting really, really comfortable with that statement. All religious roads lead to heaven. And they say, I've got news for you folks. That simply is not true. <gasps> Did he say that from up there? Yeah, I did. That's simply not true. Now, it would be a lot easier for you and me if that were true. We could just accept everybody, not worry about what they believe. We could just go on our merry way and, and just believe with all of our heart everybody was going to meet us in heaven one day and we'll all sing Kumbaya together. I, I mean, we, we could do that I mean, if, if that were true. But it's not true. The fact is, it's just plain wrong. Not long ago, a friend of mine from high school posted on her Facebook page a great big banner that said coexist. The poster had the Star of David. It had the moon and crescent. It had the colors of the gay movement all intertwined inside of it. It even had the cross for the Christian symbol. It had it all on there. And the idea was we should all get along because all roads lead to heaven. That was the idea. I'm sure that by now you've seen this poster. Mainly because I've got it on the screen right behind me. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure you saw it. It's, it's right up there right now. I had a talk with her and I said, you know, you got to understand, not everybody is friendly toward everyone else. There are actually some religions out there that if you don't believe like they believe, they think you ought to die. And they're okay with being the ones to take you out. How can you coexist with someone who's waiting for an opportunity to kill you and rule the world? How can you do that? How can you coexist like that? Friends, her point was all roads lead to heaven. We should just learn to coexist. But I wrote to her and I let her know that that just simply won't work in a world. Now I'm going to use the name of another religion because you should have figured this out by now. If not, you're pretty slow. Islam wants to wipe out all Christians and all Jews. Islam wants to establish Sharia law around the world. Islam is not a religion, it's a political system that disguises itself as a religion of peace. In reality, Islam, Islam stands for submission. And they believe that everybody in this world should submit to their way of rule or they should die. How are you going to coexist with that? Now I'm not telling you to run out here and do anything bad to them. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying we need to realize not all roads lead to heaven. You don't get to heaven by strapping a bomb on yourself and going out and blowing up a whole bunch of people. It doesn't work that way. And yet there are religions that teach that. It is hard to coexist with folks who spend their time planning ways to kill you and take over the world. Now she didn't want to hear that. And what that makes her 
is one of only a few Facebook friends that used to be fake Facebook friends that are no longer Facebook friends. <laughs> I think I got deleted. Uh, <laughs> happens sometimes. She had bought into this politically correct facade. The powers that be, they want us to believe that it doesn't matter whether you worship Allah, Jehovah, or a rock. That's what they want you to believe. To these folks, it doesn't matter whether you believe Jesus is God or just a good man. To these folks, it doesn't matter whether you worship a man who's laying in a tomb or Jesus who is sitting on a throne. I'm here to tell you today, it does matter. It does matter. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out a reality that might make some of you uncomfortable, but that I don't want you to miss. Where's the back door, just in case? Okay. Let me trim. <laughs> Gotta be ready. Just get out of here quick. Doesn't work out well. I'm not talking about family squabbles. There's a lot of family squabbles that exist between Bible-believing Christians. But I got news for you. If we are agreeing on the fundamentals, mankind has sinned. If you believe mankind sinned and needs a Savior, we're on the same page. If you believe that the fact that we need a Savior made it necessary for God to send one, we're on the same page. If you believe that God sent that Savior and that that Savior was Jesus, we're on the same page. If you believe that Jesus came to earth as a man and died to be our Savior, we're on the same page. I don't care what name's above the door. We're on the same page. If you believe that he rose again, proving that he was victorious over death, we're on the same page. If you believe that through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus purchased grace once for all, we're on the same page. If you believe that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, we're on the same page. If you believe that Jesus is coming again, we're on the same page. You are my brother and sister in Christ if you believe who were sinners in need of grace that God provided once for all. Our man-made squabbles don't change the fact that we're all a part of the same family, the family of God. Now we can use different music and still worship together. I still like a lot of the old hymns. I know them better than I know some of these new songs. Sometimes I'm looking at the new songs, I'm like, I'm glad we're doing this stuff. But I still like the old stuff. We can use different music and still get along. We can support different traditions and still get along as family. We might argue a little, but we can still consider one another family. We can meet in large groups or we can meet in small ones and still be family. We can have a subdued worship service. Or we can have an animated worship service and still get along with one another because we are family. There is, however, one thing that will cause us to part company. And that one thing is revealed in today's focus text. There is no other name under heaven through which mankind must be saved other than the name of Jesus. The Apostle Peter turned his back on Jesus at his trial. Remember? I don't know that man. I don't know that man. Now, you're not going to like this. But then he said, I blankety blank don't know that man. It says he cursed and said he didn't know him. <gasps> Peter? Yeah, he wasn't perfect either. When Jesus, a few days later, came to Peter there by the seashore, and he laid things out for him, Peter finally got it. He finally wrapped his mind around the importance of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. If you remember when Jesus told him he was going to die, Peter said, ain't no way, Jack. No, that's not exactly what he said. But that's what he meant. No way. 
And you know what Jesus said to Peter? Get behind me, Satan! <laughs> because he knew that wasn't Peter talking, that was Satan using Peter to try and get him to let his guard down. But when he came back to Peter, he asked him again and again, Do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you love me, Peter? Three times he gave him a chance to admit that he loved him. And there's a whole lot of Greek stuff in there. I'm not going to go there. I don't do Greek today. Jesus had proven once for all that he had power over death. And he proved it by raising from the dead. There is absolutely no one else who can make that claim. No one else who can make that claim and back it up. Jesus is the only name under heaven through which mankind must be saved. If you don't believe that, we get to park companies. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. There is no other name under heaven through which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verses 9 to 12 puts it this way. Let's just read it. It says there, it's on the screen by the way, it says, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and they're asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Friends, either you accept Jesus as Lord or you are lost. The fact is, Buddha can't save you because Jesus is Lord. I'm looking a whole lot more like Buddha all the time. <laughs> but Buddha can't save you. Don't even matter if you look like him. He can't save you because Jesus is Lord. Your ancestors and your connection to them, they can't save you because Jesus is Lord. Muhammad, he can't save you because Jesus is Lord. Krishna, Remember those people in those funny colored robes that used to walk around asking for money at the airports? Krishna can't save you because Jesus is Lord. Joseph Smith, that's the founder of the Mormons in case you didn't know, he can't save you because Jesus is Lord. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. Friends, Christ alone rose victorious over death never to die again. The grace provided by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the only road to salvation. Only Jesus has an empty grave that he left behind. There is no other name under heaven through which mankind must be saved. Political correctness won't make those other religions effective. Doesn't matter how many people think it's okay, it's not going to make them right. Because we can't all be right. Remember we talked about that a while ago. You weren't sure about it. But I'm telling you we can't all be right. Jesus alone is Lord. And Jesus tells us plainly. That he is the way and the truth and the life. In John chapter 14 verse 6. It will be up on the screen there. It says Jesus answered. So who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus. Just make sure you're with me. Jesus answered. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I am the only way you're ever going to get to heaven. I'm the only way. In essence, Jesus is saying, none of these other things are going to cut it. You've got to come to me because I alone am Lord. To try and promote the idea that other belief systems pack the same power as Christianity is simply to become a snake oil salesman, if you would. Well, let me illustrate Imagine, if you would, not that I'm this smart, because I'm not, but imagine that I somehow found the cure to cancer. And we tested it, and it was 100% effective. It cured cancer in anyone, anytime you take this, 
and you drink it and you're cured. Imagine that I have found that cure for cancer. It's 100% effective. I've bottled it and I've sold it to you because you're someone with cancer. What's going to happen? It's 100% effective. You're going to get cured. You're going to get well. You're not going to have cancer anymore. Because it was 100% surefire cure for cancer. And I, I sold it to you. It, it's your cure. Now. It's something that's going to make you better. Now, if someone copied my bottling to make it look like my cancer cure and filled those mock bottles with water, if they did that and sold that water pretending that it was 100% cure for cancer and you bought that and you took it, what's going to happen? You're going to continue to have cancer. <laughs> You're not going to get any better. You're still going to have cancer, right? It's just, that's the way it is. Uh, the snake oil salesman would be promising a cure that he didn't possess. Friends, Jesus is the 100% effective cure for sin. There is no other cure. He's made the cure available free of charge. He's not even going to sell it to you. He's going to give it to you. But there are those out there who in their desire for greatness have bottled water and pretended that it's the cure for mankind's sin. Come follow me. I'll make sure you get to heaven. Come blow yourself up and you get to go to heaven underneath your fruit trees and have a bunch of virgins around you. I won't tell you what I said on Wednesday. There's not enough time to list all those who have promoted this kind of a farce, because there's just too many of them. Far too many, and it would be far too confusing just to try and list them all. So let's do this. Let's promote the real thing. Remember that commercial that Coke had? It said, Coke is the real thing. You know, there's, there's a lot of other drinks out there, but Coke is the real thing. Friends, I got news for you. Jesus is the real thing. Can't help it if you like those other drinks. I'm a Mountain Dew person myself. Orange Sun Kiss, those two, you know. Um, but whenever it comes down to this, Dr. Pepper, <laughs> what, what does Dr. Pepper in that one say? Drink Dr. Pepper, it's the most original soft drink ever in the whole life. Yeah, I, I remember that one, Dr. Pepper. Yeah, but, but let's use the Coke one for right now. Jesus is the real thing. There is no other name under heaven through which mankind must be saved. You can count on Jesus because he's already blazed the trail. He's proven that he has power over death. He's proven that he's more than just a man. Jesus was God revealed in the flesh. The Lion of Judah, if you will. He was prophet, priest, and king. Our Savior. He's the Lamb of God who came to pay the price of sin once for all. The devil doesn't want us to grasp that reality. He doesn't want us to get it. He wants to cover our eyes and keep us from seeing that. The devil has enlisted snake oil salesmen to try and pull us into the pit of hell for all eternity. That's what the devil wants. But God is not willing that any of us should perish. And he is holding on to us. He is holding on to us. He is holding on to us for all he is worth. Reminds me of a story. A story I read not long ago. A story of a mother who held on to her son in spite of overwhelming circumstances. Let me just tell the story. One hot summer day, way down in southern Florida, a place my wife doesn't want to go, doesn't like it down there, a little boy decided to go for a swim in the swimming hole out behind his house. He was, a, he was in a hurry to dive into that, that cold water, man. He wanted to cool down those, those hot, muggy Florida days. He just wanted to hop in there and swim. As he ran out the door of the house, he left his shoes behind, he left his socks behind, he left his shirt behind, and he went and he jumped in the water and began to swim out toward the middle of the little lake that was behind their house. And as he swam out toward the middle of the lake, an alligator came in behind him to get between him and the bank. His mom was standing there in the house. She was washing dishes, looking out the window. And as she looked out the window, saw him swimming in the lake, she could see that ugly old alligator swimming over to get between him and the bank so that when he came back, 
it would be waiting there for supper. In utter terror, that mom ran out, yelling and screaming like a banshee. She wanted her son to come to safety. She was screaming as loud as she could scream. Hearing her voice, the little boy, he became alarmed and frightened, and he began to swim for all he was worth back toward his mother. But it was too late. Just as he reached her, the alligator reached him, reached out with those strong, locking jaws, and grabbed a hold of the little boy by the legs. But just as he latched down on his legs, that loving mother got a hold of that little boy's arms, and she had a hold of him for all she was worth. A terrible tug of war began between the mother and the gator over that little boy. The alligator was determined to make her son his lunch, and that mother was determined never to let go of her son. They were screaming and yelling and flailing in the water. You know, a farmer who happened to be passing by in his truck heard the screams. He heard the screams, saw what was going on, reached up to the gun rack back behind his seat, pulled out that rifle, and he went running out to where the alligator was trying to eat the boy, and he shot it dead. Took the little boy to the hospital. He was chewed up. He was in bad shape. It took him several weeks in the hospital to finally get better. Everything had begun to heal up, but he was scarred all over. It was a vicious attack. That old gator had took his toll on his legs. As it came time for him to leave the hospital, a newspaper reporter came over that wanted to write his story. Wanted him to show him the scars. The little boy reached down and pulled up his pant leg and showed him the scars that the gator had left there. But then with a smile on his face, in spite of those terrible scars, with a smile on his face, and with great pride, he looked at the reporter and he said, Mister, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ought to see the scars on my arms. I've got some really great scars on my arms. I have them on my arms because my mama wouldn't let that old gator have me. Friends, God loves us every bit as much as that mother loved her son. And God wouldn't let Satan have us. This meal reminds us of that. God wouldn't let Satan have us. The scars on Jesus' hand, the scars on Jesus' feet, prove it. God wouldn't let Satan have us. This table reminds us weekly, God wouldn't let Satan have us because he loves us this much. It's not going to be easy for us to cling to our faith in a world of political correctness. Political correctness is trying to pull us into the abyss. But we've got a God who can and who will hold on to us if we will run or swim, as the case may be, into his loving arms. Have you put your trust in Jesus? Have you accepted the gift paid for in full by the love of God? The gift that we're reminded of on a weekly basis. If not, if you've not yet accepted God's love gift, there is no better time than now to come and claim that gift of love paid for in full on Calvary because God didn't want to let you go. Won't you come as we stand this morning as we sing the love of God? You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.